they are also the kind of family that do not just passively stay and enjoy their criminal status, they actively pursue it, generation after generation. So we are talking here about people who are not just, you know, enjoying their status of family dynasty, they are actively doing it still. And again, with the deal changes, with the Australian twist, which is by working with the bikers, for example, by diversifying and uh, not doing cocaine, as in not importing cocaine, because cocaine is, you know, someone else's business, we do MDMA. So it, there are, you know, adjustments that they make, and this is what makes them particularly interesting until today. In June 2007, a massive cargo ship from Italy arrived at the port of Melbourne in Australia. A tip-off had led law enforcement to one container in particular, a container filled with thousands of tins of tomatoes. Hidden within the tins were tons and tons of ecstasy pills, 4.4 tons to be precise, that's around 15 million pills. Now at the time, this huge discovery was the largest ecstasy bust in the world with a street value of $440 million. The size of this discovery was unexpected and it meant that the Australian Federal Police, or AFP, had to make a decision. They'd found these drugs, but not those behind it. And given the quantity being imported, it clearly belonged to a large and well-organized criminal network with international partners. So they closed it up, left the container at the port and waited, but no one arrived. Over the next 12 months, the AFP investigated and closed in on those responsible. The criminal syndicate was based out of Melbourne, New South Wales and South Australia, and had partners in Italy. The men at the centre of this drug shipment were Francesco, Frank, Modafferi and Pasquale, Pat, Barbaro. This is Deep Dive, the global initiative against transnational organised crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. We're in discussion with Anna Sergi, Professor of Criminology at the University of Essex, member of the GI Network of Experts and author of the new book, Chasing the Mafia, Ndrangheta, Memories and Journeys. In the last episode, we looked at the Aspromonte in Calabria, the birthplace of the Ndrangheta and how the clans used kidnapping and the ransoms that were paid to expand into other illicit markets. But in this episode, we're going to follow Anna from Platy in Calabria to Australia as we track a criminal dynasty and the rise of the Ndrangheta down under. Welcome to Ndrangheta, part two. Ndrangheta royalty, down under. Hanno individuato e sequestrato un altro ingentissimo carico di cocaina purissima nel porto di Geatauro. Cacciatore in Italian literally means the hunter. We were heading to where they'd captured one Indrangheta member who'd been hiding out for two years. They say they're looking for gang members in Germany, Canada and up to five in Australia. Some 500 defendants, 600 lawyers and more than 900 witnesses in total. Italy's largest mafia trial in decades has begun. The seller of an unfinished house in the village of Platti had a concealed door in the wall. The carabinieri demonstrate how part of the wall can roll backwards on rails, exposing the entrance to a bunker. More than 200 kilos of pure cocaine has been seized in the southern Italian province of Reggio Calabria. The Indragada are not just an Australian problem, they are a global problem. I feel empty, psychologically, I'm really empty. At the end of the last episode, we talked about the Scarella kidnapping and that the negotiations were handled by a person called Giuseppe Barbaro, the leader of a prominent clan based out of Platy in Calabria. Now, Platy has a long association with the Ndrangheta. So the Platy is known as the brain of the Ndrangheta, while San Luca, the village next door, is known as the heart of the Ndrangheta. San Luca is where the Lady of the Mountain Sanctuary is. Uh, so it's also very specific. That's why it's the heart. But Platy is from where the kidnappings were organized. So eventually the families from the village are royalty of the Ndrangheta even today. 
And in Australia, this comes up fairly vividly because in Australia, the Ndrangheta clans are many, not just from Plati, but the Plati clans have historically held and still do hold a prominent position. No one enjoys more of a reputation than those clans historically. And that reputation is what keeps the organization together still today. It what gives the identity to the Australian Drangheta today. It what allows and allowed the Drangheta in Australia to be alive and well for 100 years, even though obviously there are periods of less fortune from a criminal perspective. But the fact that you have, again, royalty clans They mostly come from the Plati area and a couple of nearby villages because obviously they intertwine, they marry, they intermarry, they they create alliances with uh, close people nearby. It's definitely what makes the Australian Drangheta very different from other settlements of the Drangheta abroad. Okay, so let's look at the Drangheta in Plati, where you have names like Trimboli, Agresta, Pera and Barbaro. Despite these different names, these families are all intermarried. And they're also connected to other prominent families, Papalia, Musitano and Sergi. These families have spread from Calabria to North America and from Northern Italy to Australia. Indeed, during Anna's travels to Australia to a place called Griffith, which we'll come to later, the gravestones that dot the local cemetery contain these same names. These same names from Plati. Now... This is not to say that everyone with those names is a member of the Undrangheta. I mean, Anna is a prime example of that. But Trimboli, Barbaro, Agresta, Pera, Papalia, Sergi, they're all there. And so that brings me to the Barbaros, and it's a question of where to start. I think we should pick up from where we left off in the last episode, and that's Plati, the small village on the slopes of Aspromonte in Calabria. To understand the Undrangheta in Australia, you have to know about Plati. And in a world of thieves, reputation is king, and the Barbaro name does a lot of heavy lifting. They are royalty, I keep saying this, and they are royalty for various reasons, because nothing in Ndrangheta is just just in Ndrangheta, in the place where we are looking. So to understand why the Barbaro family became what it became in Australia is also because at the same time, let's say the 80s, the 70s, when their power was growing in Australia, their power was also growing in the north of Italy. So the Barbaro are intermarried with a number of families, including the Papalia family. And the Papalia family, Antonio Papalia, was the boss of Lombardia, the region where Milan is. But not just the boss of the Ndrangheta, it was the boss of the underworld, let's call it that, of a structure that put together all the main groups of uh, organized crime in the area around Milan. So we are talking here about someone that in the 70s was recognized even by Cosa Nostra as the head of the Lombardia. And he was married in the Barbaro family, he was a you know, standalone figure. At the same time, the Barbaro back in Calabria were part of the main structure of the Ndrangheta from Plati. Cousins of them, two cousins were active in Canada and they were heavily involved in the heroin trafficking at the time of Cosa Nostra, the pizza connection and the Cosa Nostra families. They always had very apical roles. Just to jump in, the pizza connection, as Anna said, was an international heroin trafficking business led by Cosa Nostra. This was truly transnational. During the 80s, it was thought that $1.6 billion worth were smuggled into the US in tins of tomatoes. Sound familiar? And with wholesale distribution going through pizza parlours. So that's why in Australia, their role is on the one end, not surprising. If you know their history, it just fits with everything else that this family has been doing in other places of the world and Italy. But at the same time, it is surprising because it's the most obvious example of this dynasty, the mafia dynasty in itself, but more importantly, the intergenerational changes. I can't say it enough, but obviously the new generations of this, even the ones who have been killed, uh, Pasquale Tim Barbaro was killed in uh, 2016, was a bit older than 30 year old, I think. He must have been 35. He was a very different type of, let's say, gangster. (laughs) If you pass me the, the comment, he was fully Australian. They even made a TV series about it, uh, which is called Australian Gangster. Yeah! 
You're successful in business, it's normal to have it. You got nine separate people trying to kill you. That's not normal. Police! Don't draw attention to yourself. So the way this uh, new generation of the Barbaro looks back at his grandfathers, who were fully Calabrian and fully resembling the Calabrian, let's say, Ndranghetista, is the most interesting thing from a sociological and criminological perspective, because you have a family that represents the Ndrangheta in Australia, is one of the two families probably that mostly is associated with organized crime in Australia, mafia type. The other one is the Sergi family, with whom the Barbaro are married. Remember in the last episode when we talked about how brands need a history? And the Ndrangheta's was quite interesting, the three brothers who were all medieval Spanish knights and so on. Well, in Australia, they also have a founding myth. Although not medieval, but 1922 instead. But it does follow some remarkably similar tropes, and a Barbaro was part of that story. So the history of the Ndrangheta in Australia starts with a birthday on the 18th of December 1922, so almost 100 years, um, where the three founding members of the Ndrangheta, including a man known as Antonio Barbaro, uh, misspelled Barbara, who did arrive for real in the ship uh, named King of Italy, which is the one that uh, arrived in Fremantle on the 18th of December 1922, uh, and then in Adelaide and then in, uh, in Melbourne. So th- this man was actually there. He was <laughs> on that ship, uh, according to National Archives. Uh, and he was known to be a Ndrangheta man, one who was heavily involved in document forgery, for example, to have other Italians, other Calabrian come to Australia at the time. So he was eventually known to the authorities of both countries for being part of the Barbaro mafia family. So whether or not he founded the Ndrangheta, then obviously it's a different story. But it is early on, so it is 1922. We already have realistically a couple of hundreds, probably a bit more of Calabrians from those villages already in Australia by that time, but not that many. So it seems plausible in a way. But nevertheless, I mean, the fact that the Barbaro family is such a prominent uh, element of anyone who wants to learn about the Ndrangheta, even just the Ndrangheta history or representation in Australia, does say quite a lot about the fact that there is a legend about them, whether this legend is fully true or not. It doesn't really matter, does it? In 1962, Antonio Barbaro, who was delightfully known as The Toad, ascended to the top of the Ndrangheta, at the time also known as the Black Hand or Honoured Society in Australia. But the toad died shortly after of natural causes, leaving a power vacuum. The violence that followed came to be known as the Victoria Market Murders, with both rival contenders being killed. Eventually, a man by the name of Laborio Benvenuto emerged as the highest ranking Ndrangheta member in Melbourne and therefore Australia. Now, fast forward just a few years to the 1970s and a place called Griffith in New South Wales. Oh, Griffith is a fantastic place in the sense that once you go there, you really see how the Italianness of the place has been somewhat crystallised in ways that other places of Australia do, did not do. So uh, Griffith was a multicultural experiment of Australia. It was meant to be one of the villages that was built on migrants' colonies, essentially. So over 70% of the population of Griffith was Italian, of which over 40%, I think, was the estimate were Calabrian. So a lot of this Calabrian, I can't remember the estimates again, uh, were from the Platy area. So obviously we are talking here about not just the founding members of the Ndrangheta, but we are talking about normal people who went um, to this to Griffith and uh, worked there and you know put their roots there. And uh, this creates the sense of community that these families from the same villages in the Estromonte created in Griffith is, is fundamental to the crystallization of the Ndrangheta subculture itself. <laughs> 
It would be fair to ask why so many people from Platy emigrated to Australia and to Griffith in particular. And there are likely to be a number of reasons for this. But certainly natural disaster back in Platy is as good a reason as any. In 1951, severe flooding hit the village. Years later, Anna's father reported in a newspaper that the waters came from the throat of Aspromonte and took away two thirds of the poor households. A number of people died. After the flood, it was thought around 5,000 people left Platy, many settling in Australia and Griffith specifically. Now in New South Wales, you have a region called Riverina and this is wine country, and Griffith is at the heart of it. It's a wealthy part of the state. The city of Griffith was only founded in 1916, and migration from Calabria started that same decade. And remember in the last episode, we talked about the money that was made by the Ndrangheta through kidnapping in Calabria. Some of that money was sent to Australia to buy land and to invest into businesses. And it will be places like Griffith where that money likely ended up. Alongside the wine that is produced here, Griffith and the Riverina region also became synonymous with cannabis. Those select few farms that grew the drugs sent the product to Sydney or Melbourne, and they started to grow wealthy, building large palatial homes. And if you watch news reports from back in the 70s, these houses are known locally as grass castles. In 1975, a local business owner, politician and anti-drugs campaigner, Donald McKay, stumbled across information about a marijuana plantation in a place called Colliamboli about 60 kilometers from Griffith. And he passed this information over to law enforcement, who raided the farm and found 60 million Australian dollars worth of cannabis. Two years later, Donald McKay disappeared. So there is a problem there because obviously Griffith has a bit of a reputation historically in the Ndrangheta and it's linked this reputation to a murder that happened in 1977, Donald McKay. Donald McKay is one of the cold cases of Australia, still unsolved, still open. And it's known as the disappearance slash murder because we never, they never found the body. But obviously we assume he's dead. We assume mafia families disposed of the body in uh, usual ways. But the problem with this murder is that it sparked, obviously, indignation in Australia. Mm-hmm. And it basically put the spotlight on Griffith and say, OK, what the hell is going on in this rural town of New South Wales? The fallout from the 1975 Colliamboli bust, at the time the biggest in Australian history, and the subsequent disappearance of Donald McKay, forced the government to act. By 1979, the Woodward Royal Commission into Drug Trafficking was published. Well, they basically identified that in Griffith there are five families. These five families are all from Platy. Platy. They are all belonging to the Honor Society. And uh, the Sergi Barbaro family is the most prominent one, which obviously you can imagine my um, happiness in seeing my surname that way. And they are responsible for the murder of Donald McKay. Now, this did never end up uh, in a criminal proceeding, uh, which is fascinating in itself, and it's one of the odd things that happened in Australia. They never saw justice, in a way. It had such a resonance that changed the way crime that happened in Griffith was somehow seen. So before this inquiry, yes, people were involved in a cannabis plantation, okay, whatever. But after this, the, the spectre, <laughs> the ghost of the owner society became somewhat expected in the village. And it also, unfortunately, and I'm going to say this with mixed feelings, it did fuel some of the races against the Calabrian community. The good Calabrian community, obviously, because the fact that you have a surname that is Calabrian or is even a mafia surname does not mean, by all means, that you are always connected to this. So it's a particular story, the one of Griffith, because still today, the importance of those families is undisputed. Even if crime happens elsewhere, they are the gatekeepers of the Ndrangheta. They are the ones who keep uh, intact the reputation of the organization in a way. They are, again, they are royalty. So they don't have to be involved in crime or not directly so to, to be that. And at the same time, they are the enablers of everything else 
in the name of the honor society. So it's a tricky story, the one of, of Griffith, of course, obviously, which does also involve victimization of the Calabrian community. The disappearance two years ago of Donald Bruce McKay fanned waspish feeling against Italians in Griffith. After all, a few of them had recent convictions for growing marijuana, and Don McKay was renowned for his hostility to the drug. His presumed murder and the public outcry that followed hastened the Royal Commission. Anxious politicians were determined to produce the culprits. Perhaps the nearest they've come so far is this headline. Certainly no one has been charged, but the finger is still pointed. The Woodward Commission named a few people, including a Sergi Anna Trimbley, but also a Barbaro, Frank Littletrees Barbaro. Francesco Barbaro was born in Calabria in 1937, in, you guessed it, Platy. He belonged to the Ucastanu branch of the Barbaro family. So you remember the Scarella kidnapping at the end of the last episode, how reportedly Giuseppe Barbaro handled the negotiations for her release from his prison cell. He is also from this same Barbaro branch. The cousin of Frank Little Trees, also called Francesco, was the capo locale, so the head of the families in Platy. So that's the Barbaro Papalia regime. I know this is complicated and there are a lot of similarities in names and this can make it confusing because there are lots of Francescos and Pasquales and so on. But family is so important in understanding the Ndrangheta clans. Those blood relations or relationships secured by marriage are strong and provide an element of trust in an otherwise murky world. And this really is a family affair. According to historian John Dickey, some male children of Ndrangheta bosses go through the initiation ritual at birth, which means the criminal education starts early. And this is why you get these criminal dynasties. And these criminal dynasties then have wide networks of extended family. So let me give you a story from Anna's book that highlights this. In Australia, there was a father who had a problem. His son-in-law was demanding his daughter's dowry now that they were married. The father approached Frank Littletree's Barbaro and his compatriot, Little Dominic Sergi, to help solve this problem. Littletree's and Little Dominic and the father arranged for the couple to travel to Calabria, where the son-in-law would be killed. Phone calls between Australia and Platy arranged everything. When the couple arrived, the son-in-law was indeed murdered. The father then had to travel to Platy to get his now widowed daughter back. She wouldn't be released until he paid for the contract killing. And it's here where the father met the man who had arranged the murder in Calabria, a man named Rosario Rossi Barbaro, the head of the clan in Platy and brother of Frank Littletree's Barbaro. I talked about the, some families being the royalty of the Ndrangheta, and I didn't use the term uh, lightly because uh, I, it, it is a hint to my approach uh, to the Ndrangheta, certain Ndrangheta families as criminal dynasties. And the word dynasty in itself should evoke an idea of intergenerational transmission of criminal activity. A dynasty is more than one generation. They normally have, business-wise, a preferred business activity. They will be based on certain type of values uh, or lack of values. So something distinguishable to them. In the same way as the, the kind of the Barbaro family, Drangheta family that we talked about is distinguishable in history because of their involvement in the kidnappings and the fact that they provoked a shockwave uh, of change in the Drangheta. There are other families similar to that and there are ways in which you recognize them and you kind of attach a brand to them for the ways they behave. So the, the dynasty is something that I've been exploring. I want to explore more. And I, I especially the international reach of these dynasties is what absolutely fascinates me because it's the most normal and in coming from Calabria, uh, but also the most concerning aspect of the Ndrangheta. It's the most normal from what I told you at the very, very beginning of this podcast. The, the fact that everyone has, there is a sense of a kind of a shared experience in the migration of the villages in Aspromonte. You always talk about your relatives who are in America, in Canada, in Australia. So everyone knows each other's migrants in a way and try to connect 
each other's migrants even abroad. So there is this sense that migration is part of the daily life of uh, the villages. So that's why it's normal to me when I see that this specific family, they had unit in uh, Toronto and then they have another unit in Perth and then they have another unit in Belgium. That doesn't surprise me because the family itself, the way migration worked from those villages allows that easily. But at the same time, trying to figure out how the, the various units of the dynasties keep together under the same brand name in the Ndrangheta is probably one of the most intriguing research questions ever. Because it's not just about uh, doing business together, it's about uh, attaching yourself to an identity, the one that your surname gives you, and your surname meaning with all the baggage of your surname uh, that is way beyond just doing business together. Frank Littletree's Barbaro had a son with Elizabeth Sergi, the sister of Tony Sergi, who was also named in the Woodward Royal Commission as a leading Ndrangheta member, something he always denied. He referred to Drangheta, uh, an honoured society. Well, I never heard him and I never was involved in that sort of a thing. Have you heard of such a thing? Oh, uh, I heard him as Godfather because it was a film. I saw the film. And... Uh, Rata, I never heard him that sort of words here. You must have heard of Drangheti in your native Calabria. I had him. Oh, I was too young when I came from Calabria. I was 17. Back in Calabria, the Sergi clan are another leading Andrangheta family. So was this a strategic marriage between two Andrangheta clans? Who knows? The son of Frank and Elizabeth, born in Griffith and described in Anna's book as the Andrangheta's golden boy, his name was Pasquale Pat Barbaro, and we've met him before. Last time we heard from Pat, his container full of tins of tomatoes, note the similarity to the famous pizza connection, had been busted by Australian law enforcement, discovering hundreds of millions of dollars worth of ecstasy hidden inside. The drugs had then been taken and replaced with harmless tablets, sealed up back in their tomato tins, popped back in the container and returned to the dock, and a waiting game had begun. Fundamentally, for a drug shipment of that size, it's clear that international partners were involved. This was a Calabrian and Drangheta operation. So you need to trust those involved because you're dealing with a lot of money. And these are the type of people who will come looking for it if they aren't paid. There's a documentary by ABC's Four Corners and Fairfax Media that tells this story brilliantly. Tonight on Four Corners, drugs, murder and political influence. The Italian mafia has a long and infamous history in Australia. Remember the Griffith Marijuana Network, the drug lord Robert Trimboli, the murder of anti-drugs campaigner Donald McKay. That may all seem like ancient history, but what we will show you tonight and again next week is that in the decades since then, the so-called Honoured Society, Andrangheta, headquartered in Calabria in southern Italy, has built a massive operation in Australia, bringing in huge quantities of drugs and infiltrating mainstream Australian politics. As Pat Barbro and his associate Frank Modaffery scurried around looking to find out what had happened to the drug shipment, which included accusing others of stealing it and trying to manipulate a journalist to release a story to find out what had happened to it. In the meantime, the AFP continued to gather intelligence and information. One thing that was striking about this, despite the large quantities of drugs being seized, this didn't stop this syndicate from continuing to import drugs. The same investigation seized 150 kilos of cocaine in Melbourne a few months later. Through intercepted phone calls, the AFP could hear that the suppliers were beginning to get impatient. And what I find really interesting here is, did Pat Barbaro get a little more time to get the money because he is a Barbaro? Obviously, it's impossible to know without talking to those involved, but it would be fascinating to know if this is an example of a trusted brand at work. So that's uh, probably one of the strength of the organizational setting of the Ndrangheta ever, <laughs> overall, compared also to other mafia groups. So there are different type of brands. The internal ones 
the family surname, and the external one, which is the Ndrangheta one. So obviously it means different things to different people. If you are in Calabria and someone tells you that they belong to a certain family and you have knowledge of the area where you're coming from, you will know what that surname means in a way, in relation obviously to the Ndrangheta, not in general. I want to be very, very clear that not everyone with the same surname is automatically a member of the Ndrangheta family with that same surname. But at the same time, being uh, under the same umbrella, under the brand name, is kind of like a, an extra guarantee you have. It means that you are not just a family dynasty of crime, but you are a dynasty within other dynasties. So it, you do not move alone. You do not handle your, well, you might handle your business alone, but you might not handle your, let's say, everything else that is around the criminal activity alone you have the strength of those around you that share the same umbrella. And this is something that other, uh, that for example, distinguish mafia studies from professional crime uh, studies. I mean, there are, although in everyone around the world, you have criminal families in a way. So families where more than one generation is involved in crime. But that is very different from being part of a crime criminal family, which is part of an organization made of other criminal families. So it's a very different story when you, you can use your internal brand name across the other families and your external brand name with everyone else. And everyone else doesn't just mean Calabrians, it means uh, Australians, it means politicians, it means everyone who has ever heard about the Ndrangheta. So in, in a way, we are also, um, this is also the price to pay for shedding knowledge about it. We are strengthening the brand as well, somehow. Pat Barbaro was eventually arrested by Australian law enforcement and sentenced to a minimum of 30 years in prison. This story perfectly encapsulates that continued connection between Calabria and those Ndrangheta enclaves around the world. They maintain those roots and connections but adapt to their local environment. And they also have the power of a name, the brand of a criminal dynasty. The story of the Barbaros is not just Frank Littletrees or Pat Barbaro. This criminal dynasty has so much more to its story in Australia. There was Operation Cerberus, which tried to map the Andrangheta families and their associations using an informant. Then there was another Pasquale Barbaro, known as Principale. He was one of the most senior Andrangetisti in Australia. And yet, that informant that I just mentioned in Operation Cerberus, that was him. He was eventually shot dead. Other Barbaros have taken different paths, such as joining biker gangs. And then there's the Australian gangster, the one we heard about before, also called Pasquale Barbaro, the flamboyant social media savvy grandson of Principale, who was also killed in 2016 by a group of bikers aged just 35. There are, of course, others. As Anna says in her book, the name Barbaro can be both a blessing and a curse in the criminal underworld. They are also the kind of family that do not just passively stay and enjoy their criminal status, they actively pursue it, generation after generation. You mentioned the tomato tins. It was massively a Calabrian operation in the sense of the Calabrian Mafia, clearly both from Italy and in Australia. It had at its head Pasquale Barbaro, who is the uh, son of uh, Frank Little Trees Barbaro, who was supposed to be the boss of the family in Griffith during the period of the murder of Donald McKay. So we are talking here about people who are not just, you know, enjoying their status of family dynasty, they are actively doing it still. And again, with the new changes, with the Australian twist, which is by working with the bikers, for example, by diversifying and uh, not doing cocaine, as in not importing cocaine, because cocaine is, you know, someone else's business, we do MDMA. So it, there are, you know, adjustments that they make, and this is what makes them particularly interesting until today. Anna writes in her book that mafias are in the culture of places and communities. They originate in it, they stick to it, they mould culture to their needs, they distort it, adapt to it. So the Barbaros are just one Andrangheta clan in Australia, albeit an important one. But there are others. For example, the Sedeno group, who are a bridge between Calabria, Australia 
and Canada. And so in the final episode, we'll look at the Soderno Group in Canada before returning to Calabria one last time through one of the major cocaine gateways into Europe, the port of Joya Tauro. Thank you for listening to this episode of Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. A big thank you to Anna Sergi for joining us for these episodes. Anna's book, Chasing the Mafia, and Drangheta Memories and Journeys, is available now. Please take a moment to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast and go and check out our website, which is globalinitiative.net, where you can find all of our latest research into organised crime. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with our final episode on the Ndrangheta. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.